Want to introduce the wow factor into your garden home? We've got some showstoppers coming up right after this. Over the past 20 years as a garden designer, I've enjoyed helping homeowners create private sanctuaries full of beauty and wonder. I find each garden to be a fresh opportunity to explore ways to create uniquely personal spaces. These are just a few of the gardens I've helped to transform into garden homes. Hi, I'm Alan Smith. Welcome to The Garden Home. This is a show about garden design and blurring the lines between inside and out. Now in today's show, what we're going to talk about is bringing a little oomph or pizzazz into the garden. And we're going to do that with annuals. Now don't go, oh gosh, I don't want to grow annuals because I have to plant them every year. If you think that way, you're going to miss out on lots of glorious bloom in your garden. Just take a look at some of these. And if you're thinking these plants must have cost me a fortune, well, I'm here to set the record straight. For the price of a package of seeds, you can have beautiful plantings like these. I invited some seed experts into my garden to clear up some of the common problems that people have when it comes to planting with seeds. I'll also share with you ornamental grasses that certainly add drama to the landscape. Now that's a plant with some flair. And I'll show you some plants that I'm happy to invite year after year into my garden because of their proven performance. Right now, let's get started on a tour of some of the annuals that are making the garden home so beautiful. Now for me, when it comes to choosing annuals, or really any plant in my garden, it's all about performance and performance under the toughest conditions. Just look at all of these blooms, and I have to tell you, over the last few weeks, it has been one hot and dry summer. Many of the days have been over 100 degrees, but this performance, well, this is what I'm looking for. Now, let's stop just a minute and talk about the difference between an annual and a perennial. You see, annuals are plants that complete their life cycle in one growing season. So, the zinnias and scabiosas and the cosmos and all the things that you see blooming along here, well, you plant the seed in the spring, they come up, they bloom, and then at the end of the season, the frost knocks them back and they die. Perennials, on the other hand, will come back year after year. They are perennial in the garden. Some of our classic favorites are daylilies, phlox, and certainly peonies, which can last in a garden for up to 75 years. Now, let's get back to annuals. Take a look at this one. This is amazing. It's a petunia, you're right, but this thing is such an outstanding performer, it's called a supertunia. This one's called Vista Bubblegum Pink, and it's been performing like this, well, for five months in my garden. So you can bet this one's gonna show up year after year. Now you may say, all right, how do you get them to bloom like this? Well, it's very simple. There are three things you need to keep in mind. First, get the soil right. These are raised beds. Underneath all of these blooms, you'll find the wood border that creates the raised bed, and in it, I worked in some really good potting soil, okay? I don't mean just stuff that you go dig up out of the backyard. I'm talking about some amended soil that really makes these things perform. You don't want heavy clay soil. They need good drainage. Second thing is consistent watering. We keep the soil consistently moist. That's so important. I'd never let these go completely dry because if they do, well, it debilitates the plant, the blooms begin to drop, and it takes, even though you're gonna put more food and water back on them, it takes them three to four weeks to recover. The third thing is feed them. These things are heavy feeders. They really, really need to be fed, I think, with a slow-release fertilizer in the beginning and then throughout the growing season, supplement them with some fish emulsion or some sort of all-purpose liquid fertilizer. That's what makes them perform. Now, come on, I wanna show you some more things around here that are in full bloom. You're gonna love them. So if you take a look right here, you can see I've got some of these old-fashioned single zinnias really putting on quite a show. What's so great about having a few of these every summer is that you can grow them directly from seed, they come up in no time, and you can cut flowers from them for months and months and months. And look at this coleus, isn't this gorgeous? I like to mix the foliage plants with the bloomers. So this deep burgundy color with the 
little chartreuse edge is perfect to go with the zinnias. And then over here, look at this, grown from seed, this is one of my favorite everlastings or plants that you can dry. This is a Soloisia, and just look at those tall vertical blooms. This thing will bloom all summer long. show you something here that to me is quite remarkable. This is a bed of sunflowers. Now you might say what's so remarkable about sunflowers? Well what I'll say is that they germinate so quickly. Look at these young plants. These were planted only about two and a half weeks ago and look at how they're growing. This is a plant that anyone can grow. So if you're a little nervous about going into the realm of annuals and sowing seed, start with sunflowers. And just don't think of the single yellow sunflower. There are lots of sunflower varieties to choose from. In fact, one of my favorites is right here. This one's called Moulin Rouge, and it has a beautiful mahogany-colored flower. Now, if you consider sunflowers a bit on the commonplace, and you want something a bit more exotic, come over here, I want to show you something that's downright bizarre. So take a look at this. It looks like something from another planet, or at least its seed pods do. This is a plant which is in the Asclepius, or butterfly weed family, okay? You can tell that by the tiny little blooms, the fact the butterflies love it, and it's very milky, like a milkweed. Now, the name of this is Gymnocarpa, and the cultivar name is Oscar. So here's something, an annual, that you can grow from seed that is extremely bizarre and interesting. And another thing about it is that you can actually dry these round seed pods, which look sort of like, like some sort of sea creature. Now some of the other interesting annuals I'm growing here are this Polish amaranths with their amazing plumes and gorgeous foliage, as well as a little zinnia. Well, it's actually not a zinnia, it's a tithonia, but it's called Mexican zinnia and has incredibly bright orange flowers. Now, as you can see, there's really something here for everyone, the more sophisticated gardener as well as the beginner. Now, I admit, sometimes gardening from seed can be a bit daunting, but with a little encouragement, well, that can carry you a long way. Ashley is new to gardening and found herself working for a seed manufacturer. As you can imagine, she had lots of questions. Now that's where Ann comes in. For many years, Ann has been answering questions from gardeners on a seed helpline. Let's listen in. Ann, what are we doing today? We're trying to start a garden from seed. Have you ever grown directly from seed? No, I haven't, but I think it'd be very interesting. Oh, it's fun to do, and it is interesting and rewarding. We need a good planting medium. We can either start with what we call a peat pellet, Right. Or we can go to peat strips with a good potting mix in there. Okay, well um, I'm really interested in seeing how these work. You pour enough water to swell them to about an inch to an inch and a half. It takes about a third of a cup of water for each one to reach its full size. Right, well where do you put the seed in the peat pellet? Well, why don't we just do that? Okay. I see this is a zinnia. We're gonna let you do this. Okay. How many do I put in a pellet? Each planting point needs two or three seeds. Okay, well, you put them in the middle, in the top. A lot of people take a small toothpick and just pull a little soil back over there. Okay. So how do these eventually come about? The seedling will emerge right here at the planting point. Okay. Now for the gardener who is indoors in the winter, we're going to take the bottom of this. It rests gently on the top and it creates a greenhouse effect. Oh, that's very interesting. I've seen that before. Right. Yeah. And the pellets have enough water in them to generate all the moisture you'll need. Can you put different types of seed in one? Oh yes, oh. yes. Another way is to go either to an individual pot. What them. exactly is this container made out of? It's peat, Okay. It's dug from a peat bog. Oh, okay. No additives, no fertilizer, natural. And it'll eventually seep through, right? Right, so you'd want this in some type base or tray. And then once this is finished and something sprouts a little, what do you do with it then? 
the zinnias you planted ultimately are going to go directly to your garden when the weather is suitable. Also on the package I noticed that there's a lot of information, so how do we go from that to here? Okay, uh, the information is good, but it doesn't answer all the questions. Right. For instance, there's always a map of the United States color-coded, and it correlates with a strip off to the side, which tells you the range of months during which you can go directly to your garden. And early January, February, people get anxious and they want to start indoors. Look at the last frost date back up about six weeks. And this is perfect for that, absolutely. Right, right. That goes in a sunny window, planting from seeds to have this beautiful result. It is interesting and rewarding. And plus it's a sense of accomplishment. That's true. Whether you're interested in growing flowers to cut or just to enjoy in your garden, there are always a few basic principles you can follow for a more successful growing season and a more beautiful garden. Let's start with water. The key is consistency. You never want your flower beds to dry out completely. This can be tough on your plants, particularly young ones. They rarely recover. One of my favorite ways to water is to use a soaker hose like this. It deep soaks the ground, which encourages a deep root system and a stronger plant. Then, I just put a layer of mulch around them to help hold the moisture. Feeding is also important. To grow a beautiful stand of annuals like these and maintain them, I find that they like to be fed about once a month. Now, there are a lot of different brands of fertilizer out there on the market, but I go for an all-purpose fertilizer that has a high ratio of phosphorus. That'll encourage lots of blooms, and that's the middle number on the label. Now, I also go for one that's water-soluble or is a liquid because this gets the nutrient into the plant quicker. Another way to keep your flowers blooming longer is to keep the dead blossoms removed. Some flowers like zinnia and spider flower actually bloom more the more you cut them. Then there are other varieties like these begonias and patience and periwinkle that don't require deadheading at all. No matter what the flower is, if it grows tall and leggy by mid-season, I cut it off to about six to eight inches fertilize it and then it'll flush again. Now at the end of the season, to encourage hardy volunteers to come back next year, things like larkspur, bachelor buttons, and globe amaranth, I shake the plants out and make sure the seed gets scattered through the beds. The next spring they come up and bloom again. Throughout my garden you'll find annuals that act like perennials in that they come back year after year. Now this is because they drop seeds. They volunteer to return. Some of the best for this include larkspur, bachelor buttons, saloisia, and globe amaranth, or sometimes called gomfrina. Now, not only do I make room for this plant in my borders at the Garden Home Retreat, but it's also a staple in my city garden. You know, over the years, I've discovered that my summer garden wouldn't be the same without the help of annuals such as Cosmos, Nicotiana, begonias, impatience, and this little guy I always come back to each year called globe amaranth or gomfrina. Now I like it because it comes in a range of colors, a magenta purple, a white, a strawberry red, and this one which is pale pink. I like it the best because it blends with all the plants I have in these borders. Another aspect I like about this old-fashioned annual is that you can look at it as an everlasting in two different ways. First, if you let the seed drop to the flower bed each fall, you'll be rewarded with volunteer plants each spring. And the second way it's an everlasting is that the blooms themselves will last a long time. Just cut them in the summer, bundle them together, and dry them for fall arrangements. Drying flowers for a fall arrangement is an excellent way to bring the outdoors in. Here are some cutting and drying tips. First, you want to cut flowers in the early morning when they're the freshest and cut a lengthy stem when possible. Get the flower into water as soon as you can and soak the stem as high as you can without the blossom touching the water. And keep the flowers in a cool, dry place. Now for drying, there are several different ways you can approach this. Hanging most flowers upside down will work. For fragile blooms like Queen Anne's Lace, you might want to lay the bloom end down on a drying rack like this so that the flower doesn't curl up. For grasses with their beautiful plumes, 
all I do is take some hairspray and spray them so they don't shatter and fall apart. Now when we think about annuals, and I'm one of them, I tend to think more of foliage, plants, or blooms, and I forget about the grasses. Some of these grasses, like this giant burgundy fountain grass, which has beautiful foliage, is actually an annual, unless you live like in South Florida or someplace. This thing is not that hardy, but I plant it every year when I can find it because it is so dramatic. And what's great about this is I like to cut these blades of grass and mix them with like red zinnias and other things. It can make some really dramatic summer bouquets. These can be beautiful in flower arrangements, and of course they can be just the wow factor you need in the garden. If you've been reluctant to try ornamental grasses because you thought that they were going to be just a little too wild, you may want to take another look at them. Now I have to say, I got really turned on to these grasses of all kinds in a big way when I visited Holland several years ago. There I had an opportunity to visit the private garden of the famous Dutch designer named Piet Oldhoff, who specializes in incorporating natural looking plantings into the landscape. And ornamental grasses, among other plants such as perennials and annuals, certainly play a key role in these designs. Oh my goodness, this is gorgeous, Pete. Where do you get inspiration for your work? Now, nowadays I would say from nature, but uh, it, in fact it's something that they developed through the years. Well, your style is very naturalistic. Yeah, it is, but it's not, uh, of course the plants are not wild. They're cultivated plants that behave very well for the garden, but they try to catch the emotion you get in the wild or in nature. Yes, I can see that. But they're not all wild, but they look uh, very much as they are wild plants. You use a lot of grasses as well. Yeah, but not more than 30%, I think, otherwise they take over. So I see, yeah. We use the grasses for the lushness, the, the, the movement. Yes, the movement is so good, isn't it? They're a beautiful backdrop. They are, yes, and uh, you see they work like curtains from one uh, side uh, to the other side. It's, it, yeah, it's a beautiful backdrop, and they move in the wind, and the colors are good in autumn. Well, he here we are in late summer, and the garden is really uh, uh, rising to a crescendo. It's so much energy going on that I think that is what gets you. Don't think that your whole garden has to flower. Find the right balance. Yeah, having things that will produce foliage and texture, yeah. that's equally important to the bloom. Yeah. Very important. Yeah. So, Pete, what are some of your favorite combinations that you've discovered of late? Um, now, I think working with um, not only working with grasses, but the combination with umbellifers and grasses to make, give it more the, the natural spirit. So I think you move forward in, in making it even more natural, Very looking good. natural. But at the same time, it should be uh, a garden. Even in the heat of summer, certain plants perform over and over and over again, like these coleus. I know I have my favorites, and I will admit coleus, well, would have to be one of them. They're such good value. I mean, look at this. They were planted early in the spring, as soon as the temperatures began to warm up, and they just continue to flourish. This chartreuse colored one is a favorite because of its name. It's called Granny Smith. This one, on the other hand, with this gorgeous salmon leaf, is one called Sedona. Now, why I like these so much is that they provide incredible color just in the leaf alone. And you can see here, late in the summer, they're throwing up these spires of lavender flowers. They serve as the perfect backdrop for lots of other bloomers. Here, you can see we have the orange cosmos in bloom, zinnias, as well as lantanas, all working together. In this tiny bed, you can see there's a profusion of color. The other thing that I want to point out here is the texture they provide. It's so important and often underrated. Just the leaves themselves provide wonderful contrast to all of these various flower forms. I enjoy visiting gardens where the family has really invested their time into creating something special. And that was certainly the case in the garden of Mike and Becky Owens, who participated in the garden tour during the International Master Gardener Conference in Little Rock, Arkansas. 
We started our gardening in Arizona when we first got married. We actually bought this house because of the gardens. We loved the trees and the natural setting and what was already somewhat of an established garden here. It's basically a woodland garden, but it has a formal part to it and an informal part to it, a part that we've let go natural in which um, that part is the back part of the gardens and it can only survive with the natural rain that it gets. But the formal part, it's an old garden that was built in around the 60s. They had more formal plantings and we've, we've kind of loosened that design up and had more curved beds put in. Some of the other things we did was bring in more hardscape. The first thing that most people notice when they come in through our gate into the backyard is the water feature and then the greenhouse. We put the water feature in its spot for the greeting and we have an, an open iron gate and you can actually hear it and see it as you approach the backyard. So um, it's, it's very uh, appealing to call you in. And why don't you tell them about our greenhouse? We also have a, an old glass greenhouse that was built in the 80s. We don't use it functionally now, mainly because it's very inefficient. It's not caulked or anything. It's built by the old standards. And actually, we've just reacquired it because my daughter played in it for the first five or six years that we were here. And she's just relinquished it as she's um, outgrown it now. I can go in and plant in there. We still probably won't overwinter plants because of the safety issues with it, but we work in it and keep our pots and tools in it as well. We have other areas in the yard like a patio, uh, which we is a stamped concrete patio, which we entertain on. And everything, the views from that patio were meant to really be good. So, for instance, you can see the greenhouse and the water feature. There's a play area for little children because we'll often have families over with little children. And then it's a point from which we actually walk the paths. We have a lot of paths and which are mulched and we, my wife and I will walk oh, frequently down these paths. And we like the effect it has on us. It's very calming. And there's a little secret hidden garden area back in the very back where my daughter and our next door neighbor used to play when they were little and they have little teapots and a phone back there. We didn't tell her for years that it wasn't hooked up, but it's back there with little tables and things. And most of the paths were set up and we spent a lot of time leveling them because she ran through the garden. Um, and we, so we had many years in which she enjoyed it and I hope she takes that on for the next generation for her children and enjoy gardening as much as we did for her as well. As you can see, it is very dry out here. This has been a record summer for no rain and high temperatures. I thought last year was rough, but I tell you, who knows where it's going? We need moisture. What I'm doing here is I'm putting in another well. We drilled the well last year, but now we're gonna tie a line to it so we can take care of the garden, we can take care of the animals. We've got several wells up here, so I'm very lucky, but I don't wanna to put too much pressure on any one of them. This well up here was a great find because what we have is 60 gallons a minute coming out of there. We had to drill to 280 feet. So what Ricky's doing here is he's burying the water line and we also had to run electricity up there in order to run the pump. I don't like power lines standing out in this landscape, so we buried them. I mean, as you know, water is so essential. What we have here are the water storage tanks. We're taking and we're harvesting the rainwater off the building. We also have to lean on these wells, and we have six ponds, so those are our three water sources at this point. Well, here we have another example. This time, our little friend, the gold amaranth, an annual integrated among all these perennials and giving us beauty and color through the entire season. Well, that's all the time we have for today's show. I hope you've figured out some ways to integrate annuals in your garden, whether you start them from seed or pick up the plants at the nursery. Until next time, from the Garden Home, I'm Alan Smith. More information about today's topic and other topics covered in this series can be found at pallensmith.com. On an upcoming episode of P. Allen Smith's Garden Home. They're one of the best investments you can make for your garden. Perennials, we'll take a look at a wide range of them that will help beautify your garden home. Be inspired by an English border. Find out what plants make good background shrubs. 
see what tricks I'm using to make my flower beds look instantly more mature. Plus, get some ideas on end-of-the-year savings on perennials. We'll see you in the garden home.